Friends, today we're going to just take a quick look at something. It's called the good person graph. Here's what it looks like. In, in creation, we have God, high, holy, and lifted up. He is God Almighty. He creates and so he created and sustains all things, right? But there's this thing that happened when, um, when sin entered the picture. There was a barrier between God and his created order. And so let's just say there's a scale here. Worst person in the history of the wor world, we'll just say Adolf Hitler, because it's kind of a given. Everybody knows he was evil. But then there's, there's some good people, right? There's good people. There's, there's grandma, and, um, and then there's like Mother Teresa, who she was pretty awesome and she was a good person, right? Then like down here a little bit below grandma, you can say like, you know, Pastor Eric's on there and, and you have this graph of good people. But here's the problem. You still have a holy God and you have this barrier of sin that has blocked us from getting to God. We can't be in relationship with God because no matter how good you are or how bad you are, there is always this area here and this barrier. There's always the gap. No matter how good of a person you are, the reality is you're never good enough to bridge the gap between humanity and God. What I would like you to do now is take a minute and read Ephesians chapter two, verses one to three. It's where Paul kind of talks about how we are children of wrath. And it sounds a little harsh, but what I'd like for you to do is read the, the regular version in the NIV, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 in Ephesians. And then after that, turn and read the same text in the message written by, uh, transliterated by Eugene Peterson. So go ahead and do that, and then we'll talk some more. That line in the, the message that says, you filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and you breathed out disobedience. It really reminds us that everything we do um, when we're under the heredity of sin is, is against God and it's not how it was meant to be. And the reality with sin is this. In scripture, sin always equaled death. Think about it. In Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened right after that? God made clothes for them out of the skins of an animal, which means an animal died that very day. The first death recorded in scripture is that of an animal whose skin was used to make clothing for Adam and Eve. Sin equals death. God continued to communicate this to his people in Leviticus. In Leviticus, I believe it was Leviticus chapter uh, four, um, really three, four, and five is where this uh, takes place. And um, what you see is God puts out the order of, of how you handle sin in the sacrificial system that the Hebrews had. This is before Jesus back in the ancient covenant of Israel and the law. And God would have them kill different animals and place them on the altar because, well, where there's sin, there's death. And God kept death always before his people, reminding them of the cost of sin. That really hasn't changed, even in our context. Death is ever before us. And what we recognize is sin equals death today, just like it did in the ancient world. Just like it did in that text in Ephesians. Sin always equals death. Since sin equals death today, I think a scripture from Romans that really stands out and makes it clear is a, is a text from Romans 8, 20 to 22. And it says that for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Listen to what Paul says here. We know that the time, that, I'm sorry, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, groaning under the bondage and the weight of sin. And the reality is that there are broken places and places we break in our lives because we are under the heredity of sin, but we're also, we make choices that break people. 
and break our own lives. Our sin results in death. Sometimes we're just affected by it. We didn't do anything wrong, but sin's effects are all around us. Death, disease, sorrow, and heartache. They're all present, but there's also things we do wrong. So today, what, what I'm asking you to do through this week is to really take a look and ask the question, what's groaning around you? How is sin causing the world around you to groan under its weight and its burden? And also, that's just seeing the broken places. But there's places we break. So what's groaning in your own life? Where's the weight of sin pushing down in your own life? Places that you break by living willfully in sin. Friends, the reality is that this scripture leaves us with a weighty feeling. We cannot forget this. Paul has an end to this section. Verse 4 starts out, but thanks be to God. We'll talk about that next week. But for this week, I want you to focus in with me. Where is the world groaning around you? And where in your own life are you groaning under the weight of sin? Question one, do you think sin is a real thing? Take a minute, talk amongst your table. Do you think sin is a real thing? Over the question number two, over the last week, where have you seen evidence of a fallen world that's living under the curse of sin in and around your life? Question number three, how do you think sin equals death? Where's the evidence? The Bible refers to the fall in a few different ways. The first way is sin. Sin is an archery term uh, originally, and, and it meant to miss the mark. Like you shoot your arrow, and it misses the mark, right? It doesn't hit its intended target. That's one of the ways that um, sin is described. It also speaks of transgressions, things you, trans you transgress the law, or you, you disobey the rule. And then there's the term iniquities. And this, sin, this is a sin that is something that is like a deformity in our character or within our heart. Can you think of examples of a sin where you maybe missed the mark, of a transgression where you maybe just didn't do what was right, or an iniquity that seems to be an inherent sin within you? A pattern of sin you can't break. It takes a little bit of vulnerability. It takes some time. Talk about that. The word holy in Hebrew means to be set apart. God is holy and he can't be in relationship with sin. So I want you to take a minute and look at what happened when the sin of the world was laid on Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 and 46. Take a minute and have someone in your group read that. And remember God being holy and Jesus taking on the sin of the world You'll see the response and the interaction there. It's actually a quote that comes from Psalm 22 that Jesus cries out. Take a minute, read that, and we'll be back with a question. What happened with Jesus' relationship with his heavenly Father when the sin of the world was laid upon him? Why do we not take sin seriously? So during the Enlightenment, there was this idea, the, the, the tabula rosa, the clean slate, that humanity starts out with a clean slate. 
And if we look at this, we, we know that's not true. But in the Enlightenment, you, it was thought you could become a better or worse person depending on your opportunities or choices. A lot of people still believe this idea, but the Bible tells us we're sinful by nature, born under the curse. So here's my question. Why is this hard truth? Why is this a difficult truth for some of us to accept? And why does the good person argument, the I'll go to heaven because I'm a good person argument, fall short? So I know this isn't the most enjoyable topic ever, but if this were the end of the story, if this was the end of the gospel that we are inherently under the curse of sin and we can't get to God no matter how good we are, how would you feel about that? I mean, be honest, tell your group, how would you feel if this was the end of the gospel? Thankfully, there is a tiny little three-letter word at the end or that follows this passage in Ephesians. What is it? Before you close your small group, I want to show you something. There is one who made the leap. One who bridged the gap. His name was Jesus. And Jesus Christ can redeem Mother Teresa. Jesus can redeem your grandma. Jesus can even redeem Pastor Eric. And had Adolf Hitler wanted to receive forgiveness in Jesus Christ, even someone like Adolf Hitler could be redeemed. What does that tell us? It tells us this, that in Jesus there's hope. We're not bound by our good works. We're not bound by the curse.